Okay, we're ready? Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Vollmer, Medical Director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center and Co-Director of the Rocky Mountain MS Clinic at the University of Colorado Hospital. We are putting on this uh, webinar on uh, ocalizumab, which has a brand name, Volcrebis, uh, basically to help anybody who's thinking about this drug by answering questions as best we can and also helping to just support your physicians in terms of being able to help you move forward if you would like to try this medication. So, how do I get to move? I just have, I'm having trouble moving the slides. Give me a second here. Go, oh, have you used those, okay. So, these are, this slide is uh, very important for you to understand in that it's important for you to know what financial relationships speakers like me might have particularly with a company that's manufacturing the drug that I'm going to be talking about. As you can see, I have consulted with a large number of companies and we have quite a few grants. That includes Genentech and Roche, uh, which are the companies that are involved with uh, Ocrevus or Ocalizumab. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know. So just to get started here, I wanted to review a little bit with you what B lymphocytes are, or also called B cells. These are part of the immune system that uh, work with the rest of the immune system to help you respond to infections, cancer, and other issues. They're made in the bone marrow, which is, you can see here, uh, they come from a stem cell and they turn into pre-B cells. Those cells move to your lymph nodes and spleen, and there they become activated and educated in terms of what kind of a protein target they're respond, responding to. As these cells proliferate in the lymph node and spleen, they then enter the blood and circulate to the brain. And some of those cells are capable of promoting inflammation in multiple sclerosis. So they cross the blood-brain barrier. They then activate a whole cascade of events that leads to the inflammation that causes the demyelination and damages the brain. The ocalizumab, as well as rituximab, are monoclonal antibodies that specifically target a protein that's only expressed on these cells, and it starts from the pre-B cell up to the memory B cell, and that protein is called CD20. It's not expressed on anything else in the body, which makes these drugs very selective in the way they work. It turns out why this is important in MS is that you have a lymph node at the base of the skull called a deep cervical lymph node and that's connected to your brain, and spinal fluid drains into it on a regular basis. Current data suggests it's in that lymph node that B cells that can cause MS are generated, and they move from that lymph node back into the blood and, again, cross the blood-brain barrier where they, make, uh, where they cause an MS plaque and damage to the brain. And what's happening with ocalizumab and rituximab is they're catching it in that intravascular phase where it's moving into the bloodstream, and kills the cells there so they're not able to circulate to the brain and cross the blood-brain barrier and cause problems. And that has turned out to be a very key issue for multiple sclerosis, and it's identified these B cells as being the primary driver of the inflammation that characterizes multiple sclerosis. So the studies, uh, the phase three trials that led to the approval of ocalizumab were called the OPER1 and OPER2 studies. These were in relapsing, remitting, and secondary progressive MS. These are large studies. They involved uh, over 1,600 patients, 800 patients on ocalizumab, and around 1,800 800 patients that were on Revif, which is an interferon therapy. So to briefly review these uh, studies, these studies actually were uh, designed to be identical, and they were uh, very similar in all characteristics. This is listing the baseline characteristics of the patients, and the reason that we list that is just to make sure there's no imbalances uh, in the population that we're studying to that would confound the results. And as you can see here, there are no significant differences. The groups are very well matched. This is the primary outcome of the study. This is looking at the number of relapses that are occurring per patient over the two years of the study. In, in both studies are listed here independently, but they have exactly the same results. So here is the Rebif patients. Again, they're interferon that's injected uh, three times a week. And they're compared against ocalizumab that is injected once every six months. And what you can see here that compared to the Rebif, the ocalizumab decreased the relapse by another almost 50%. And it made the actual number of relapses per patient uh, down to 
relapses per patient per year, which is quite low. It's about 65% uh, lower than what the natural history is, and that occurred in both studies. This is looking at a secondary outcome. In other words, the study wasn't dependent upon this in order to succeed. It was dependent on the relapse rates, but this is looking at progression of disability. So the definition here for confirmed disability progression is that patients have a worsening on a scale called the EDSS that lasts for three months in this first case and six months in the second case. And this data is combined from the two studies. This is a standard definition for disability progression used in essentially all MS clinical trials. And what you can see here is that the blue line here is the ocalizumab on both sides, and the purplish line is the rebit patients. And basically, uh, the treatment with ocalizumab decreased the risk of having any progression of the disability by around 60%, 40 to 60%. Sorry. And so that's a good, strong finding, not something we see with all the therapies, but is similar to Tasabri and possibly Tengolimod or uh, Gelenia in terms of uh, benefit. So that's a very important outcome. They also looked at new MRI lesions occurring uh, in patients on either Rebif or the ocalizumab. And they're looking at six months, one year, and then two years. And they're comparing the two studies, which again have essentially identical results. And basically what we see is that compared to the Rebif patients in the first six months, there was over a 90% reduction in new lesion formation. And in, at one year, it was close to 100% and that held out to week 96. It turned out that in the study, the new lesions that did form, which were relatively few, occurred mostly in the first three months of treatment. That indicates that the treatment takes about three months to really have full effect, and that's something to keep in mind if you decide to go on this therapy. You need to give it at least three months for it to stabilize things. So this level of reduction has not been seen with any prior study of any other MS agent. This is looking at brain volume change. The reason that this is important for us is that brain volume change, in other words, how fast the brain is shrinking, which occurs in all of us, but it's faster in MS patients, determines long-term disability. So the rate of the brain shrinking is a very powerful predictor of the disability someone might have 5, 10, 15 years down the road. The the difference here may not look that large, but it is statistically significant, and the trend is for the uh, ocalizumab patients to begin flattening out here, and the Rebif patients will continue to go downward. We're doing more studies on that now, um, but it may be that it takes uh, two to three years, maybe longer, for the uh, rate of brain volume loss to normalize and be equal to patients who don't have MS. And we have some preliminary data with Tasabri and with Jeleni that that does occur. The next table over here, or the graph, is looking at a definition of disease activity in MS called no evidence of disease activity. And we're looking at the percent of patients that had no relapses, no new MRI lesions, and no progression of disability over the two years of the study. And what you can see is that in the interferon group, only about 30% of patients reached that definition. And in the ocalizumab group, it was closer to 48%, close to 50%. This is a, a, an increasingly important outcome that we use in the treatment of MS to determine whether a therapy is working adequately. We really want, in this day and age, to use a therapy that really prevents patients from having any further disease activity. That would allow them to reach this def definition of need of no evidence of disease activity. We're actually interested in uh, even having a better outcome, which we call NIDA plus, and that means patients have no evidence of disease activity, plus they're getting better. And that is possible with the more modern therapies, including Tasabri, Gelenia, and uh, Ocalizumab. In this particular uh, table, it's looking at the results in the primary progressive study, which is called the Oratorio study. The primary outcome here was looking at uh, the percent of patients that would have progression of their disability uh, lasting for uh, three months. And what you can see here is there's a, uh, a decrease in the patients on ocalizumab is 24% compared to the patients on Rebif. Whether that will continue to separate, we don't know, but that is statistically significant, and it's the first phase three trial in primary progressive MS to actually have a positive result. As 
As a consequence, the FDA has approved oclizumab for essentially all forms of MS, clinical isolated syndrome, relapse from emitting MS, secondary progressive MS, and primary progressive MS. So this is the first drug to be approved for all forms of MS, and it's a very important advancement for us. This is looking at side effects, uh, and we're looking at infusion reactions here. So the most common side effect of ocalizumab is on the first infusion in particular, patients developing an itchy rash, sometimes a red rash, scratchiness in the throat, tightness in the throat, swelling of the tongue or lips. And these are uh, allergic type reactions that occur uh, when the drug is given, sometimes due to the drug. It also may be due to the number of B cells that are dying in that short period of time. They also release inflammatory molecules that might cause this. So this uh, first table is looking at the patients that are on uh, Revit, the interferon beta, and they also received infusions once every six months. And even though the infusion was just saline, didn't have any drug in it, about 7% of patients reported some kind of an infusion reaction with the first one, and about 2 to 3% thereafter. With the oclizumab, it was closer uh, to 28% uh, of patients reported an infusion reaction with the first cycle. And in one case, one out of the, six, uh, me, one out of the 800 patients here had a more severe reaction and needed to be admitted to the hospital overnight for observation. They did fine after that, but that can occur, although it's rare. Uh, the other classifications here are mild, moderate, and severe. Mild means that we don't need to provide any other medication, such as Benadryl or steroids. The moderate and the, the, and the severe mean they required more medications. We gave them more steroids and another dose of Benadryl to control the symptoms. And that's the normal case. So if you start on ocalizumab or rituximab, you should expect on the first cycle to have some infusion reaction. Most of the time they're mild and don't require any additional treatment, but sometimes they do require more of the Benadryl and more of the steroids. The frequency of infusion reactions drop off rather dramatically after the first infusion. In this study, patients were receiving a half dose, otherwise, uh, I mean 300 milligrams, and they were given that dose twice, two weeks apart. And so this is the first dose of 300 milligrams. This is the second dose of 300 milligrams, and you can see the frequency of infusion reactions are much less. This infusion out here was the first 600 milligram infusion they got. So after the first two injections, there's the dose is 600 milligrams given once every six months. And the infusion reactions were down about 14, 15%, and they continued to drop off after that. And again, the vast majority were mild. A few required a little bit more Benadryl. So this is a typical response. And most of our patients on rituximab, where we have the most experience, are not having infusion reactions after the first one, and in fact, uh, we give them the option of not using the premedications of the steroid and the Benadryl if they wish. Another way to look at side effects of the drugs is to look at those that meet the definition of serious adverse events. This is defined by the government, and it's been in place since the 1970s. And it means that the drug either caused a hospitalization of a patient or prolonged hospitalization of a patient, was life-threatening, or was associated with cancer, or was associated with birth defects. So it's a very specific uh, definition. And what you can see here, if you look at the overall numbers of serious adverse events, they were a bit higher in the interferon beta group, the Rebif group, than they were in the oclizumab. Certainly no trend on, in the opposite. That was true for infections. There were slightly more infections with the Rebif than there were with the oclizumab. And this is indicating that the oclizumab is really not suppressing the immune system significantly for most functions. Nervous system disorders could be irritability, depression, uh, anxiety. And again, there was basically the same between the two drugs. And then uh, this last one refers primarily to infusion reaction or non-infusion reaction with side effects. And again, they were either the same or slightly less in oclizumab. So the importance behind this is that uh, oclizumab, even though it's appears to be more effective than the other medications, does not appear to be a more risky drug. In fact, uh, compared to alemtuzumab, diclizumab, uh, mitoxantral, and stem cell transplant, it's remarkably less toxic and has a much lower risk of any serious adverse event. And it's comparable to Fabry in patients that are negative for the JC virus, but probably better than what we see with Gelenia and Tecfidera.
So this is a comparison of some of the other drugs. This is a slide from, of mine. And it's looking from the published reports of the phase three trials of the impact of the treatment on sustained disability progression that's, uh, that we talked about earlier and also the effect on brain atrophy. And then I'm using my own classification in terms of the risk of a serious adverse event or a serious health problem from the drugs. And again, this is my classification. So you can see in terms of the medications we have that the reduction in sustained disability progression for rituximab and oclizumab, which are very similar drugs, is between about 21% for the primary progressive patients and 40% versus Rebif for the relapsing remitting MS patients. This is quite similar to what Tasabri does. Uh, Almtuzumab, uh, also called Lemtrada, it appears to be a little bit less effective in this category, it's similar to Gelenia. This is Tecfidera, uh, and this is the Albagio, and this is the interferons and Copaxone numbers down here. The problem with these numbers is that the studies were designed differently, and it's hard to compare these drugs directly, but you can see a trend that some of the more modern drugs appear to have a bigger effect on this particular aspect. And that's been confirmed in a number of open-label studies that have been done at various clinics around the world. The effect on brain atrophy, as I said before, is a very important issue for us because that's the strongest predictor of disability. And you can see the interferons have very little to no effect on this, and Albagio and Copaxone and Glatopa have a modest effect, and then the newer drugs have increasing effects as you go up from Alentuzumab to Tasabri to Rituximab. Uh, and oclizumab. So rituximab, we have very little data here, but we have more of the data on, on oclizumab. So these numbers may be the same, they may be different, it's hard to tell because they're different studies, but they're in the same ballpark. And this is only at two years. We have some preliminary data suggesting that the effect is even better if you look at year three and four. Over here, I'm, I'm rating the drugs based on the chance for having a serious health problem from the drug. We all know that Copaxone is uh, quite a safe drug and used as the gold standard to compare safety. Interferons have a bit of higher safety profile with some hepatitis occurring, some skin necrosis occurring, uh, and the tolerability in terms of the flu-like symptoms is a little bit worse, and that's true for uh, all the interferons. The teraflunamide, the main issue here is that there is a slight rise in infections and there's some hair loss that occurs with it and it can cause hepatitis. So again, it's, it would be similar to the interferons. The Tecfidera is similar. It has some gastrointestinal side effects and may cause some other systemic problems. Gelenia is, the problem with it is that it has impacts on the heart, lungs, and on the retina of the eye. So it takes more monitoring, but in carefully selected patients, it can be used just as safely as these drugs down here, but you have to not put patients that have diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease on Gelenia in order to minimize the risks. Alentuzumab, or Lemtrada, is a fairly risky drug in terms that about 40% of patients will develop another autoimmune disease, such as thyroid problems, but also some more serious ones related to blood clotting problems and things like that. There's also a rise in infection and appears to be a rise in cancers. Tasabri is rated as a four if patients have the JC virus. And uh, I would not recommend personally to salary to be using anybody who's positive for the JC virus. But if they're negative for the JC virus, this is a remarkably benign drug. In very large studies from the TOUCH program, looking at several thousands of patients, they do not appear to have any particular safety issues different than a non-MS population of the same distribution. That is true for rituximab, and it's also true for oclizumab. So the safety profile does not necessarily correlate with the effectiveness of the drug. So this is the last slide. This is just telling you what we do at the Rocky Mountain MS Center. All the neurologists here practice basically the same. We have the same criteria for selecting patients for different drugs and the same goal. And basically, if somebody is positive for the JC antibody, then Tasabri would be at the very bottom because of the risk with it. But rituximab and oclizumab are the first choice if we can get them approved. Uh, Gelenia and Tecfidera would be the second choice if we can't get the first two drugs approved or there's a safety issue with the patient, such as having hepatitis B or C. And then the teraflunamide and albagio would be at tier three at best, and we rarely use uh, Lemtrada or alentuzumab uh, because of the long-term problems with autoimmune disease and infections. And then the copaxone and the interference are tier four, so they'd be close to our last choice. And that's only because their level of effectiveness of preventing disability progression and relapses 
is only about 30%, whereas ocalizumab is in the 80% range, and we believe rituximab is similar to that. Over here is the classification that we use for patients that are JC negative. And I'm sorry we didn't change it, but Tisabri is actually in the tier one. So we would use rituximab, ocalizumab, or Tisabri for patients if they're JC negative. And then the second line would be the Jelani and Tecfidera, and the third line would be the Albagio and Lemtrada, and then the fourth line would be Copaxone and Interferons. So that was just a brief overview. Like now we would like to focus on questions, and they can type the questions in. Yep, there's a box on their screen. So there's a box on your screen. If you have a question, just type it in there, and uh, my colleagues here will help me get those, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. We have gotten some uh, already, and so I'm just going to move through them. There are several questions about what to expect if you go on ocalizumab in terms of changes in symptoms and disability. And basically, if you have relapsed or remitting disease or clinical isolated syndrome, or even just an abnormal MRI that led to a diagnosis of MS, in those patients, they uh, begin to notice in year two that they feel more stable and have fewer symptoms by year. End of year two, uh, most patients feel that they've had substantial improvement and are much more stable. And that continues to improve, in our experience, up to four to five years, which is about as long as we follow large numbers of patients. So relapse and remitting, or patients with relapses, tend to improve very significantly. We've had patients go from using a cane to being able to walk independently long distances and take up hiking again. For progressive patients, it's a little bit different. They definitely begin to stabilize, particularly after year two. So year three and four, most patients will come back and say they feel like they're not changing very much. They're changing a little bit but we believe that's mostly due to the effect of aging on the brain. So all of us have our brains begin to shrink around age 35, which is part of being alive. And with MS, the problem there is, is that patients with progressive forms of disease have used up the reserve capacity or the ability of the brain to compensate for this normal aging process and for injury prematurely. And as a result, that uncovers the effect of aging on disability progression. But the disability progression is much less in the treated patients after year two than it is in the untreated patients. Another question is uh, about PML. So rituximab has been used in over four million people. And there has been, have been a few cases of PML in that situation, but that was in the setting where people were getting steroids and chemotherapies at the same time. And even if you assume the risk was due to rituximab, it was less than one in 30,000. There are not any PML cases attributed to rituximab and MS, nor are there any PML cases in any indication for ocalizumab. It's not that they may not ultimately occur, but their risk appears to be very low. So I said the risk with rituximab is less than 1 in 30,000. With Tisabri, it's 1 in 180 after three years of treatment, which is a very high risk. So at this point, we do not think PML will be a major issue for this drug and probably will be less of an issue than it is for to Sabri, Jelenia, and uh, Tecfidera. Okay. There's a question on cancer, and this is a very important issue. So there's been a review of rituximab, which is very similar to opalizumab, again, which has over 4 million people exposed. And in that uh, review, there was no evidence of increased risk of cancer in that 4 million population based, over, based uh, against uh, patients who do not have MS and were not treated with that drug. However, in the phase three trials with ocalizumab, there was an imbalance in the number of cancers that occurred in the ocalizumab group versus the interferon group. So the interferon group had two cancers, I think both skin cancers, and in the ocalizumab group there was one melanoma skin cancer, one basal cell carcinoma, and then also was a case of renal cell carcinoma. But there were uh, up to six cases of uh, breast cancer if you combine the primary progressive study with the relapse remitting studies. And there were no breast cancer cases in the interferon group. Now, the issue with that is that when you do clinical trials and you look at rare events, it's not uncommon for them to be different in the two groups and yet not be related to the therapy. So that may be the explanation. It's just a random event that just is confusing the issue. But on the other hand, it's enough that we have to think about this. And as a result, there will be ongoing safety monitoring to continue to monitor the risk of having cancer if you're on ocalizumab versus on the other medications. 
right now, the number of breast cancers that occur in the orofacizumab group are fairly similar, a little bit higher, but not much of what we would expect in just a natural population being followed for the same length of time. So this is, is an issue. It's a rare event. Uh, basically, we would recommend that if uh, women go on this drug, that they should uh, definitely follow up with their physicians for the normal screening evaluations that are done for breast cancer that uh, most, women will, most women will undergo. In terms of the other cancers, we do not think that they're related to the drug at all. Those are uh, relatively low rates and similar to what we would see in a non-MS population. There's a quest, series of questions on costs. So we do expect most insurance companies, including Medicare and Medicaid, to cover the cost. However, insurances differ in terms of what your copay is or your out-of-pocket expense. It can range from zero to as much as 20%, and some patients have a uh, amount of money they have to spend on health, health before they're actually covered by their insurance. So those issues confound issues a bit, but um, ocrelizumab is actually priced lower than the other drugs with the exception of Glitopa. That's the only drug that's about $1,500 cheaper a year. So uh, the average wholesale price for ocrelizumab is $65,000. For the other drugs, it's seventy dollars to $80,000. So it's not more expensive. All the companies uh, that have drugs in this area tend to have out-of-pocket expense reduction programs or patient assistance programs that they help sponsor. That's also going to be true for oclizumab. The uh, Roche and Genentech are, have developed a patient assistance program that's very similar to what we see with the other medications. Their goal is to try to decrease the cost for patients in general to about $5 for the drug and $5 for the infusion uh, at each infusion, which means about $20 a year, which should be the cost to most patients. However, I do not know about Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, they have different rules, and it's illegal for the companies to use a patient assistance programs if you have that kind of insurance. However, with rituximab, most of our patients on Medicaid have that covered fully and don't have any out-of-pocket expenses. And our patients with Medicare that use rituximab, if they have a supplemental insurance, also seem not to have much, if any, out-of-pocket expenses. So it will vary from person to person. It's something you really need to discuss with your physician and their office team. Uh, and there is a company representative that can help with this as well. But uh, in general, I think this will be certainly no more expensive than what we see with the other medications. And then there were a number of questions about comparing this drug to Tisabri. So Tisabri is a highly effective therapy, and we've had it out since 2006. As I mentioned before, from a safety profile standpoint, the only real problem we have with Tisabri is the uh, risk of PML caused by the JC virus. And that risk is very high if you carry the JC virus. It can be as high as 1 in 80, and on average is uh, one chance in less than 200 of developing that disease, which is a very serious disease. However, patients that are JC negative and are monitored every six months for that virus, uh, we've not had any cases of PML and anybody's had more than two blood tests done for the JC virus. And uh, so, Careful monitoring for that particular issue can make Tasabri a very safe therapy. In terms of efficacy, we believe that Tasabri and Ocalizumab and Rituximab are all pretty similar to each other. So even though the clinical trial data is slightly different, they were done in different decades with different groups of patients with different clinicians. So I think they're within range of each other. And certainly our experience with Tasabri, which we have very extensive experience with, suggests that most patients do extremely well on it and over time also are improving. So if patients are JC negative to Sabri, which is given IV once a month, is certainly a reasonable alternative and is uh, quite comparable to ocalizumab in efficacy and safety. The major difference is just that the infusions with the ocalizumab or tuximab are once every six months, and with Sabri it's once a month. In patients who are on to Sabri, if they're doing well and they're negative for the JC virus, uh, we would suggest um, to either stay on the drug or switch to ocalizumab, and that's sort of a personal decision based on the number of infusions and the out-of-pocket expenses. And that's up to patients. We will tell them about both drugs and explain it and let them make the decision which one they would like to try. So many of our patients decide to stay on Tosabri. Some uh, decide to switch to ocalizumab. There's a quick question on if patients are wanting to switch Roclizumab and they have unopened bottles of Gelenia, can they return the Gelenia or you do anything with it? And the answer is no. It's actually illegal to give prescription drugs to anybody else besides the prescribed patient. 
and the pharmacies and the company can't take back the drug once it's shipped out. So unfortunately, that's an expensive uh, drug that's probably going to gather dust. You should probably discard it when there's the community programs to deal with prescription medications. Uh, there's a question about the NBC News coverage that suggested that patients go from walk, not walking to walking. We do see that in patients that have relapsed from remitting disease, but to be honest with you, it's a very rare event in patients that have progressive forms of disease, either secondary or primary. But we do see improvement, particularly in fatigue, cognition, uh, depression, uh, in patients who have progressive disease that are on these types of medications. So there are benefits. There may be possible in the future to use an additional therapy to add on to ocalizumab and to Sabri to focus mainly on repair. And there's drugs such as biotin, which is a B vitamin, alpha-lipoic acid, which is an over-the-counter medication that's used to synthesize myelin. And then there's uh, other drugs, statins, uh, liquinamode, uh, clobetazole, myconazole, that have some suggestion they may also be, to help, be able to help. So I think the future of clinical trials in progressive MS in particular will be add-on studies adding one of these therapies that might induce repair in the nervous system onto something like ocalizumab or rituximab. Okay, so I was asked to compare the potential side effects and uh, risks between these drugs. And as I've already discussed, the, in the appropriately selected patient, Tisabri and ocalizumab appear to be as safe as uh, uh, copaxone in general, and um, certainly comparable to interferons. And as we saw in the OPERA studies, it was actually superior to interferons in terms of side effects. With Jelenia and uh, Tecfidera, they definitely have more side effects. In fact, our experience is that patients on Tecfidera, about a third will discontinue the medication because of tolerability issues or MS disease activity issues within two years, and about 25% will do that with Jelenia. In our experience with uh, rituximab, if we don't include lack of insurance, then the rate is about 10% discontinuation. So I would say these drugs are more tolerable to patients. They tend to have fewer side effects. And as I said, at the doses we use with them, we really don't see a rise in infections in general, except for maybe a 4% increase in normal viral colds and influenza, but no bacterial infections, no fungal infections. So do we have any questions? Yeah, we have a few questions about the uh, transition from one treatment to another, mm -hmm. um, specifically with Jelenia, but could you talk uh, generally about maybe uh, washout periods for the different drugs and what the uh, sort of the onboarding process would be for, uh, for or for Luzumab? Sure. This is a very important question. Uh, the reason is, is that when patients go off to Sabri or Jelenia, they can have a burst of MS disease activity starting at about three months after the last dose of... Um, what we believe is a true rebound in their MS. It's not just return to normal activity, but actually an overshoot. And that MS activity leads to additional symptoms and increased disability. So in looking at the potential risk of having two drugs that affect the immune system on at the same time versus the risk of having that rebound effect, we have uh, carefully studied and documented that we can start rituximab within a month of the last dose of Tosabri which prevents the rebound effect completely so far. We've not seen any relapses in those patients and, uh, or MRI disease activity. And it does not lead to uh, increased risk of infections or other problems. So we don't see any safety issues in our practice with uh, starting the ocalizumab uh, within a month of the last dose of Tosabri. And I would say the same is true for Jelenia. We've moved hundreds of patients from these drugs to rituximab and we'll do so with ocalizumab. So I would just recommend doing it sooner and preferably before four weeks after the last dose of any of the medications. In the case of Jelenia and Tecfidera, we have patients just stop the drug the day before they went to ocalizumab with no problem either. So you don't have to wait four weeks, but I wouldn't go longer than four weeks. For the interferons and copaxone, there's no washout period. You can start ocalizumab at any time. Uh, we have a few uh, questions about the infusion process. Could mm -hmm. you just describe what, uh, what the infusion process looks like, maybe compared to some other... Uh, Sure. Treatments have been using? So uh, there's a, alentuzumab or Lemtrada is a third line drug. In other words, the FDA suggested it not be used until patients have failed other drugs, and particularly what we call the second generation first line drugs, such as ocalizumab, Tosabri, Jelenia, and Tecfidera. So I'm not going to really discuss that one because that has a different infusion rate. But 
In terms of uh, comparing this to Tassabri, which is the other key infusion that we use, the Tassabri is given monthly. It takes between one hour and three hours to get the infusion done, depending on the infusion center and whether patients have any infusion reactions. With Ocalizumab, there are two ways to start that medication. The way they did it in the studies were to split the dose, the 600 milligram dose, into two 300 milligram doses and give them individually two weeks apart. However, they have done studies giving patients a single 600 milligram infusion and a single 1,000 milligram infusion. So there's slightly more infusion reactions if you go to larger doses, but it's actually quite small. It's maybe 5% or so. So uh, whether to have the split dose or not with the ocalizumab is, again, something you can discuss with your physician, physician depending on cost issues and um, challenges of having two infusions two weeks apart. In terms of how long the infusion is, it's designed to be, after the first one, which is about two to three hours, to be done in one hour with ocalizumab. So there's about 30 minutes of time spent to get the pre-medications to work. So we do give steroids and Benadryl to patients prior to infusion with ocalizumab. And we wait 30 minutes, and then we start the ocalizumab infusion and uh, try to complete it in about an hour after the first infusion. And then the patient will be observed for another hour. That's optional. And uh, it's something I would do for the first two infusions, definitely, but they may not be necessary after that. But that's a judgment issue with you and your physician. So the infusions are shorter than they are with ocalizumab, similar to what they are with Tassabri, except they're once every six months rather than monthly. A uh, couple of follow-up questions to the infusions. Uh, does ocalizumab have to be infused at a hospital, or can they go to any infusion center? We believe you should be able to go to any infusion center. There's no special requirements by the FDA for infusing ocalizumab. And essentially, all infusion centers are comfortable with rituximab, which is basically the same drug. So there may be a, a little delay in, in terms of each infusion center reviewing the drug and getting familiar with it, but you should be able to find infusion centers close to you or less expensive than other ones, and that should be fine. And what type of monitoring would, would a patient expect between infusions? For, from the standpoint of safety monitoring, we monitor your blood counts and general chemistry panels once every six months. We also look at your B-cell counts to make sure you're being fully depleted by the drug once every six months. We screen for hepatitis and tuberculosis prior to starting the drug. We might repeat that at year two, uh, although I'm not sure that's useful, but if you're initially negative, 10 people tend to stay negative. But right now, that's the, the major issue, and that we only do that once every two years. Outside of that, there's not much else. Uh, the tradition, our habit is to get a baseline MRI after patients have been on drug for at least three months, and then to do a one-year follow-up, and if there's no difference between them, then decrease the frequency of MRIs to one every two years or less. In fact, in my practice, I don't redo the MRIs on these drugs because the MRIs don't change, so I reserve the MRIs for if there's new symptoms where we can use them then to make sure we're not seeing a, a true relapse. One last question on infusions. To clarify, infusion lengths are shorter with ocalizumab than rituximab. Is that right? Yes, but they don't need to be. The infusion times are based on the experience in cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. And uh, they, those patients were receiving uh, up to 2,000 milligrams every six months. And we're only using 500 milligrams, and we're not using it with any steroids or chemotherapy. So uh, we are working with the infusion center here. I think we're down to less than two hours now for rituximab, and I think it can be used exactly the same as ocalizumab is. With ocalizumab being cheaper than Tysavri, do you think the insurance companies will begin to force patients to move to ocalizumab if they're stable on Tysavri? I don't think they will do that with Tysavri. I think they may begin to look at the interferons, of which there are four, and the Copaxone Glatopa medications because those drugs are associated with higher health-related costs. There's more hospital visits, more relapses, more MRIs used for them. So they may begin to look at that first generation of first-line drugs, the older ones, and um, maybe urging those patients to move on to one of these more effective therapies. So we have one question about uh, dosing with Tysabri. Um, in, during the last few days before another Tysabri infusion, this person notices feeling sluggish. Uh, since the ocalizumab infusions are spaced out even further, um, what would you expect people to uh, need to prepare for as they yeah. come up on their next infusion? 
Yeah, we hear this commonly with patients both on Tosabri and Rituximab, and I expect we'll hear the same thing with Ogilizumab. There's a, a small percent, I would say it's probably 10% or less, that do feel that the effect of these infusions begins to wear off prior to the next infusion, and the timing is variable from person to person. Uh, so I don't understand the basis for that, you know, based on what we understand from the mechanism of action. I'm not quite sure why patients would have that uh, pattern, but they do, and they report it relatively regularly. So with the ocalizumab, we do not find that the patients report that this is more of a problem than it was with Tisabri. It's about the same. It's usually in the week before they get their infusions that they feel things aren't quite as good as they are right after the infusions. All right, the, the last few questions, I think, indicate how excited people are about this. Uh, folks want to know when will Ocrevus be available for infusion at UCH, and uh, being that it's just approved, uh, is there an estimate of when it will be available to patients? Well, actually, there are patients in the country that have already, already received Ocrevus, uh, Ocrevus, and uh, so it's a matter of each hospital has what we call a pharmacy and technology committee, I think it's called. Anyways, uh, I will be presenting to that committee for the University Hospital next week on the 18th to explain to them why we want this drug on the formulary so we can use it. I expect it to be approved the following week. Uh, the major delay is probably going to be insurance companies because they also have to approve it and decide how they're going to manage the drug. And um, for United Healthcare, I understand they already have made that decision and it should be approvable uh, right away. I don't know whether it require patients to have failed other therapies for MS before using this or not. We won't know that until we begin to submit those prescriptions. For uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, the other ones, it's harder to tell. Um, the companies are obviously working with all the insurance companies to try to help them move through this, as all companies do. Uh, but sometimes they can take up to six months before they finally write a policy and uh, decide whether to approve this without having appeals or not. So I expect all of them will approve it. And based on the pharmacoeconomics, I expect them to make it a tier one drug uh, in MS and possibly a preferred drug for many of the uh, insurers. I thought we were finishing up, but we did have a few more questions come in. Sure. Um, first, do, you, do we need to take a few days off for fatigue or other symptoms after the infusion of Acrebus? There are a few patients that do feel more fatigued for a few days afterwards. Um, it could be because they had an infusion reaction, which might cause that. Uh, it could be just because of the stress of going to the infusion center and, and sitting through the infusions. However, the number of patients I hear saying that is quite small. I would say it's probably in the 5% range or less. And the percent of patients that have had that problem that was significant to them has dropped off over the last few years with rituximab. I expect it to be the same with ocalizumab, but if you're sensitive to medication changes or infusions, uh, particularly progressive patients, yes, you may experience that, that fatigue. And so on the first dose, I would suggest planning for the possibility that you may not be able to do your normal activities or go to work. Uh, after that, that effect falls off rather dramatically. All right, what I think is our last question. Um, how long has Orpilutumab been on the market? I think we know that. It's just a couple of weeks now. But um, has, has the drug or something closely related to the drug been around for longer? Uh, yes. So we've been working with, on Orpilutumab for more than 10 years. Uh, we started with the Phase one studies, did the Phase two and the Phase three trials, and we've been working with a company like we do all the companies that generate MS medications. Uh, the drug is extremely similar to rituximab. So rituximab is an older molecule that was approved in 1996. It is used for lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and lymphoma. We've been using it in MS for more than 10 years. And uh, the reason it was not approved by the FDA is that the company realized they were going to lose their patent protection on rituximab before they could get to market with MS. So they generated a new molecule called opalizumab, which is more humanized but otherwise very similar. And that they developed and now have FDA approval, and it's been out for a couple of weeks. Their, the main argument for using opalizumab I think are two. Uh, one is that the manufacturers believe that the risk of developing antibodies that would neutralize the drug is lower. We don't really see much of a problem with rituximab in that situation, so it may be a little bit lower, but I don't think it's a dramatic effect, but that's the main marketing advantage, I think. The, 
The second marketing advantage is that we have more studies on oculizumab. There have been more patients treated, longer follow-up. Uh, there's only one study that's randomized with rituximab, and that was the Hermes trial done 10 years ago. Uh, so oculizumab, I would say, has more data, and, and we have better data to extrapolate from. And then the final issue is out-of-pocket expenses. B because rituximab is a off-label use, it's illegal for drug companies to have patient assistance program that might promote the drug. They can't promote drugs that they don't have approval from the FDA for. In fact, they, people can go to jail for that. So oculizumab is approved, and they do have a patient assistance program. And because it's approved, it should have a more predictable coverage by the insurance, and the out-of-pocket expenses should also be more predictable over time. Whereas with rituximab, we may get it approved the first time and then not get it approved the second time, get it covered the first time, and then they don't cover, the insurance doesn't cover the next time. It's more unpredictable. So I think having the drug approved and having the patient assistance program is also an important variable. All right, now um, I, I think most of the people on the line here are, are patients here at the Rocky Mountain MS Center, but we do have a few that are not. Mm -hmm. um, could you give a patient uh, a little bit of advice on how to get their local hospital or infusion center or even their, uh, the neurologist that they see um, up to speed on, on Acrevis and, and what they need to do to get that uh, process moving? Well, from the standpoint of the hospitals, uh, as I said, I'd, it's mainly just getting the hospital pharmacy committee to approve the drug to put on their formulary. However, the drug can be ordered through a specialty pharmacy mail order and sent directly to the infusion center you go to. So if you go to an infusion center that's not in a hospital, one that's freestanding in the community, that you may not have to worry about having that authorization through the hospital system. Uh, in terms of physicians, I think the, the issue here is that the data is relatively new, so if they haven't been involved with this uh, class of agents in the past, if they haven't used rituximab and weren't involved in the oculizumab studies, I think there's going to be some more hesitancy to use it because in the rheumatoid arthritis and lupus literature and the uh, cancer literature, there are very significant side effects, including major infections that can occur. Because we're using the drug as a solo therapy and we're using much lower dose, it's a very different drug and also understanding the mechanism of action where we, we really don't see suppression of the immune system as a significant problem with this drug is important. So if they are familiar with rituximab, I think they'll be perfectly happy with rocalizumab. If they haven't yet started either one of them, it may take them a little while to go through the various education programs that we all go through and go to the international meetings and, and get all the data they need to be able to make an informed decision. So. Uh, we're, we're happy at the Rockwood MS Center to talk with any of the physicians if they want some advice about how we manage things and, and what laboratory tests we do for safety monitoring. They can give me a call or send me an email, and we'll be happy to send them our protocol and discuss any aspect of the therapy with them. All right, that looks like that's pretty close to the end of our questions, and it is very close to the end of our time today. Um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Vollmer, for joining us, and thanks to everyone who listened online. Um, just a quick reminder, we will be posting this webinar um, on our YouTube channel later. Um, we will get an email out to everybody, including in our EMS News e-newsletter, uh, with links back to today's presentation. Will the slide set also be available at the site? Did you just want to look at the slides? Uh, yeah, I think we can make that happen. We can get the slides available as well. So if you want to look back at the data slides, they'll be available as well, just to refresh your memory. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for participating, and if there's other ways we can help, please let us know. Questions?